Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Pod People, Low Acuity Patient Treatment Stations in the Emergency Department. This is one of 10 webinars hosted by the Facility Guidelines Institute on the 2018 Guidelines for Design and Construction Documents. I'm Yvonne Carelli with FGI, and I will be your moderator during today's webinar. FGI is proud to host this series of continuing education webinars developed to broaden understanding of the guidelines documents, the revision process, and to highlight key changes in the current edition of the guidelines. To obtain AIA credit, you will need to coordinate with the person who registered your organization on MADCAD. That person will be receiving follow-up directions by email. Each attendee seeking AIA learning units must complete a 10-question quiz on the content of this webinar in order to receive AIA continuing education credit. The views and opinions expressed during today's presentation are those of the presenters and may not represent the official position of FGI nor the HGRC. And now, it's my honor to introduce today's presenters. Brian Langlands is a principal, senior medical planner, and regulatory expert at NBBJ based out of the New York office. He helped the company become recognized by Fast Company Magazine as the most innovative architecture firm in the world in 2018. Brian has worked with many of the top academic medical centers and healthcare systems, including NYU Langone Health, Mount Sinai, Penn Med, Geisinger, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Jefferson Health, University of Rochester Medical Center, and Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Brian was a member of FGI's 2018 Health Guidelines Revision Committee and is a member of the 2022 Health Guidelines Revision Committee and the Steering Committee and the Chair of Beyond Fundamentals Oversight Committee. And we have Dr. Christine Carr, who is a professor of emergency medicine at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. She is also the medical director of Health Data Exchange for Health Sciences South Carolina. After earning her bachelor's degree from Cornell University, Christine went on to complete her medical degree at the Medical University of South Carolina and in 1995 completed her residency in emergency medicine at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. Her particular expertise is in clinical informatics and healthcare design. She strongly believes data should be used to inform change in all areas. In 2008, Christine's team was awarded a $2.8 million Duke Endowment Grant to launch the Carolina eHealth Alliance Project, now one of the most robust ED-based health information exchanges in the country. In addition to her, her informatics work, Christine represents the American College of Emergency Physicians to FGI's Health Guidelines Revision Committee, and she is a steering committee member for the 2022 revision cycle. With a keen interest in relationship of facility design and improving patient care, staff efficiency, and satisfaction in hospitals, Christine serves as a thought leader at the Institute for Patient-Centered Design, lectures nationally, and leads focus groups on this topic. Welcome, Christine and Brian, and thanks so much for being with us today. Now, I will turn it over to Brian Langlands. Thank you, Yvonne, and um, it's a great pleasure to be here today uh, with um, Christine. And I just want to say thank you to everybody who's actually uh, listening in on this. Um, uh, Christine and I are very excited about uh, the white paper that we actually uh, were uh, working with, uh, along with Dr. Uh, along with David Vincent uh, and the FGI. Uh, and this white paper was published a few months ago. It's called uh, Case for the Low Acuity Patient Treatment Station, Reducing the Length of Stay for Emergency Department's Visit. And this webinar really is to focus in and help explain um, the material that we uh, ha had addressed within this white paper. The presentation uh, today is really divided into two sections. The first section is a clinical perspective, uh, which Christine will be taking us through. Uh, she'll be talking a little about, a bit about the current state that she's seeing uh, at MUSC, but also across the country. And then uh, Christine will be talking about a um, 
essentially a case study, but in this case, the case study was actually at MUSC, and Christine was um, instrumental in uh, having that project come about, uh, and we'll talk a bit about that. The second portion, uh, which will be um, more led by uh, me with Christine chiming in, um, is really talking about precedents, um, what we've seen in background, and uh, an evolution of coming uh, to where we are um, with low acuity patient treatment stations. And then uh, working with FGI and uh, thought leaders and practitioners from across the country at a workshop to determine the right size uh, for what a recommendation would be for the proposed size for low acuity patient treatment stations. And then we will finish with um, some focus on the actual language that we are proposing for the 2022 guidelines, uh, which uh, anybody really within the country can have some input in uh, during the open uh, comment and proposal period uh, when that gets going uh, later this fall. So um, with that, I am actually going to turn this over to Christine. So Christine? Thanks, Brian, and thanks, Yvonne. It, it really is truly a pleasure to be here, and um, I thank all of you in the audience for taking the time to listen to our thoughts, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts. I wanted to give some uh, context to the background on why we're, why we're discussing these low-acuity pods. Um, over the past probably 10 to 15 years, all of us would recognize that ED volumes are increasing. There's a lot of data out there that shows that smaller, more critical access hospitals are closing and shifting volumes to remaining EDs, thus the ED volumes overall are growing. Um, we, we saw in a recent survey done by the American College of Emergency Physicians that half of EP emergency physicians are seeing this rise since, particularly since 2014, um, and almost more than 90% are anticipating these volumes to increase over the next three years. 75% of 77% of those surveyed said they did not feel adequately prepared to handle the increased volume. In other words, they just didn't have the capacity. So that brings me to the next slide. In 2010, so eight years ago, some really prominent thought leaders in emergency medicine were recognizing these new trends in approaches to innovative care methods and kind of de, uh, departing from the traditional care methods of patient come in to triage, get put in a stretcher in a great big room, and then discharged or admitted. Lean principles were becoming more prevalent uh, back about 10 years ago. And so these authors did a survey where um, they asked what innovative methodologies are you employing to care for these increased volumes um, and to expand your capacity. 30% of the respondents in 2010, eight years ago, said that they'd already initiated vertical patient flow with another 40% saying that they were in progress or about to initiate vertical patient flow. 60% of those that were employing vert vertical patient flow at that time were doing it for ESIs of three, four, and five, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Of the respondents who did not, who had not already um, initiated vertical patient flow, 30% of those were about to do so, um, and 44% said they were considering doing it in the future. So this was becoming a reality. So. Um, that brings us to a study seven years later in emergency nursing. Is it working? Well, it, the, this article in the Journal of Emergency Nursing 2017 showed that for patients treated in a vertical zone, the pre and post lengths of stay went from 384 minutes down to 270 minutes, which is a remarkable drop in length of stay, they saw the, the 114 minutes when multiplied by the number of patients that they saw in that vertical patient zone gave them an additional 213 days of capacity without bricks and mortar, essentially, by simply innovating how they were caring for their patients. So that leads us to um, the considerations when you're thinking about vertical patient flow. 
and Brian and I have divided that into psychological considerations, physical considerations, and operational considerations. We'll start with talking about the psychological, which are very important uh, as an ED physician. Managing a patient's expectations are crucial to the, reducing a patient's anxiety, allowing them to meaningfully participate in their care and listen and hear what you're saying, rather than wondering what's you know, quote, what's going to happen to me, unquote. If you put a patient with a musculoskeletal injury that is, you know, is likely not a fracture, not going to require admission to the hospital, um, you're immediately managing their expectation that they will ultimately be discharged if you keep them clothed for the most part and you put them in a vertical space. You put them in a chair and they think, oh, I'm going to turn around quickly and go home soon. Um, and I'll contrast that with if you strip them down, give them a nice warm blanket and a pillow, lay them down, all of a sudden they feel like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? So really by by managing the space that they are cared for in and the environment that they are cared for in, you are in, in turn managing their expectation of discharge and ideally of a short length of stay. Some of the physical considerations in vertical patient flow are around um, our, our stewardship in healthcare, essentially. When we care for patients in chairs, the chairs have a smaller footprint. We can care for more patients in a smaller square footage, allowing us to essentially um, economize on our, our patient care. Additionally, by nature of chairs being chairs, we're not going to put high acuity patients in a chair. So we can increase our nurse to patient ratio in these particular pods instead of the typical one to three or one to 3.5 nurse to patient ratio. We could go up to one to four, one to five even for very low or minor complaints. So we economize on our um, labor as well, thereby decreasing costs in both square footage of real estate, but also in labor, which is in emergency departments is our number one cost. With careful consideration and expert architects, designers, engineers, et cetera, we could also pay particular attention to privacy if we kind of got ahead of designing these spaces, um, both acoustic and visual privacy. Um, I think Brian's gonna talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. And then lastly, we have our psychological, our physical, but our operational considerations. So we talk about putting the right patient in the right location at the right time. In other words, we want to put high, high acuity patients re requiring a resuscitation in an adequate resuscitation space. We want to put sicker patients, but not necessarily requiring a resuscitation, just a simple maybe CT scan and potential admission or discharge in a stretcher space. Um, but then we want to put our patients who just simply need a red med refill or a wound check or have a rash in a um, much smaller space without blankets and pillows and intense monitors and such. So we talk about right patient, right location, right time. This helps us imp increase our throughput for all patients if we, if we right size our patients. And I'm gonna show you some data around that later. Remember, if you put a patient on a stretcher, you're going to um, take up sheets and blankets and pillows, and you've got a tech to clean the stretcher, and it's just a fairly intense labor situation. So when we talk about operationalizing this, we talk about flow engineering, or in many cases, flow re-engineering. We're going from an older method to a more innovative, efficient method of flow. And as I just alluded to, we, in this segmented flow model, we have patients that for whatever reasons require a horizontal space, a stretcher. Those may be patients with severe abdominal pain. They could be patients with chest pain that require monitors and have the potential for decline. They clearly are things like gunshot wounds, cardiac arrest, um, respiratory, imminent failure, et cetera, that require resuscitation room. But as I also just alluded to, there are, without a doubt, patients that are very appropriate for vertical patient spaces. In Charleston, where I practice, we have a lot of visitors. 
Many of them come to the ED because they left their medications at home. They, they have nowhere else to go. So by default, they come to an ED. Again, we have our carpal tunnel syndrome that maybe just needs a wrist splint or a wound recheck, a rash, maybe some uh, situational anxiety. These are all patients that are, are very appropriate, appropriate for a vertical patient care area. Next slide. So um, it's oh. Brian here. When um, when Christine and I and, and David Vincent and others were discussing um, what is happening out there, we, we really recognize that the FGI guidelines, the regulations and codes have responded to in an admirable way and an appropriate way for dealing with patients who are unwell, patients who are sick and require to lay down. Um, and what we uh, what we really know is the type of spaces for those are the ED exam room at 120 square feet, the ED treatment bay, which can be 80 square feet. We have trauma bays for the most unwell uh, who require resuscitation, the people who are uh, uh, very, very sick. But what we don't have is we don't really have uh, defined within the regulations and the codes uh, a way to address and have appropriate space for the vertical type patient that Christine has been speaking about. Um, that's a very good point. And this, Brian and I, uh, through different paths, both recognize that we needed minimum standards around this. I want to just finish up on the operationalizing of the split flow. Many, many EDs across the country now are using what we would call a PFC, a patient flow coordinator, or a flow RN, or an air traffic controller, whatever you want to call it. But essentially, patients are very early in their presentation to the ED, oftentimes right after they walk in, um, randomized to either a vertical or a horizontal space. Historically, or typically, patients with more minor level three complaints and definitely level fours and fives are, are now being placed in these vertical patient care areas. Um, and obviously the flow RN is going to redirect a more critical patient to a, to a space that's more suited for them, a, a horizontal stretcher. And I want to use this opportunity to say Sometimes they get it wrong, and we all recognize that. ERs are very dynamic. If a patient is put in a stretcher, for example, and it turns out that their complaint is chest pain, but when you look at them and the chest pain is actually secondary to a small rash the size of a thumbprint, those patients can quickly be moved to a vertical patient care area and a more ill patient requiring stretcher can be put in that stretcher. And conversely, a patient who gets put in a vertical care area chair, and it turns out that their complaint warrants uh, the need for monitors and uh, um, stretcher, we, we move them. EDs are very dynamic, and we've, we've come across the concept, the misconcept, that when patients get put in a space, they're there for their entire ED visit, which is, which is not true. So, so essentially, um, what we are talking about here is that with the ESI, the Emergency Severity Index type patient of one and two, we are not, um, with what we're talking about today, uh, really focusing in on or uh, um, sort of requesting or demanding any changes within the spaces that currently happen within the emergency department. It's really those fives and fours and what seems to be about 50% of the threes that are truly candidates for this type of vertical treatment space. So I want to talk to you about current state. And again, reiterate, this is a great opportunity for all of you to chime in after our webinar is complete. The current state is a mess. There are no minimum standards around what we are doing with our vertical care areas. And most of us, myself included, are sort of making it up as we go. You'll see in these photographs below uh, just a hodgepodge of chairs and dividers, and they're all thrown together in any potential patient space that comes available adjacent to or even within an ED. There's no definition of a minimum standard in any of these pictures. Um, we do our best to give some acoustic privacy, to give some visual privacy, but candidly, we're not doing a very good job. And I'll let Brian highlight some of the 
more design and architectural details in these photos. If, if you take a look at the photo on the right hand side, um, you know, what do we see? That this is likely what was a uh, potentially a conference room or it was a uh, different type of space. Um, and it's been retrofitted. Um, we see that uh, somebody has installed privacy curtains um, uh, every two ceiling tiles, which means uh, these are 48 inch wide, um, I would call them treatment spaces. Um, but you'll see there's no consistency. Some of the bays have lighting. Some of them have absolutely no lighting. Um, the privacy, you know, could be considered an issue here. Lack of privacy means lack of dignity. And and really taking a look to see um, wanting to have consistent and safe spaces that are operationally efficient. We see no nurse call. We don't see any evidence of a hand washing station for infection control or hand hygiene. Um, you know, we really are looking at a space that has been retrofitted and we have seen these all over the place and you may have them in your own emergency department on the left hand side um, I was um, sort of interested to see uh, this product by quick screen where they're actually recommending for <coughs> ED ER overflow and these quick screens that can expand and contract are great for um, temporary um, you know, flu season or ER overflow, but I have started to see them come into the inside portions of the ED and are really used on a permanent basis, even though from an architectural and design standard point of view, we would actually would like these to be uh, on a temporary sort of surge influx. So I think with that, um, we are going to move into the actual case study that Christine was involved with at MUSC. Thanks, Brian. So speaking of catch, capturing any available space, uh, in our hospital, we had a research MRI that was immediately adjacent to our emergency department. And as you all know, real estate is gold, so we quickly claimed this space. But it really gave us great opportunity to think about how we can care for more patients in a more efficient manner um, in this fairly small but, but nice space. So I, at the time, was the medical director of our emergency department. I met with a very innovative architect named Steve Coe, who said, uh, what you want to do is certainly not meeting any kind of code. So we then, met with our state DHEC licensing authority who uh, was willing to come down to our hospital. He saw our extremely crowded waiting room. He saw our numbers of patients that were leaving without treatment, our increasing volumes, and our increasing lengths of stay. He agreed to approve this design, which you'll see on the next slide, which did not frankly meet any kind of existing minimum standards at all. We took the space and Steve Coe, the architect, designed this, what we call our flex pod area or D pod. He um, made rooms that were anywhere from eight feet by five to eight by eight to eight by 10. It just depends on where the room fit in this design. We um, ran this by our DHEC guy who chimed in a few things here and there. But again, we weren't relying on any minimum standards. We were trying to do what we thought was best for patients, what was best for staff. And um, I think I'll take it to the next slide, Brian. Yeah, um, I, I would like just to point out a little bit more here. Um, and what's great about what MUSC and what Christine did here is that they actually created a discrete and unique unit. Um, what we were seeing on the previous slide uh, is makeshift spaces, um, just filling, uh, you know, catch where um, one can. And um, I think with the sophistication and experience that um, uh, Christine had in working with the uh, Architect Co is really developing a space that is what we are trying to propose um, that is safe, efficient, and has the uh, appropriate support spaces within emergency departments. You'll see that 
as Christine mentioned, there's a variety of um, uh, curtained cubicles, uh, three wall cubicles um, of fully enclosed rooms. Um, you can actually see that there are three patient toilets for 12 positions, which is one in four. Um, you can see that uh, hand washing stations are distributed evenly. There's a clean room, a soiled room. It is overseen um, and observed by a nursing um, nursing station. And when we get later into the second portion of this, what we're really trying to do is understand what is the minimum requirement to give safe and efficient treatment um, within the vertical treatment space. But I did want to point out that um, the intent of what we are putting forward for the 2022 guidelines is to look at uh, potential units um, somewhat as uh, what MUSC did here. Thanks, Brian. So this is actually, these are photographs of the unit. And again, speaking to uh, what Brian was just talking about, we were able to incorporate some other concepts in this unit. So although it's a low acuity unit, we did double gas all of the rooms in the event of a mass casualty. We were very careful to have three egresses from the nurse's station in the middle. I'm not sure you'll, you can appreciate that, but efficiency for steps for the providers, but also for safety for the staff. Um, we were able to get in and out of that nurse's station in three different areas. And you can see almost diagonally across this room, which makes it really very functional. Um, so we use this very um very much now it's turned out to be a fantastic space we love the lighting we love the flow the patients really like it you'll notice the built-in cabinetry in the back those are easily wiped down between patients they're flat and you'll see the four circles those are where the gloves sit behind the cabinetry there's a sharp container immediately below the gloves and then there's a removable trash in that horizontal opening in the in the back so all of these rooms are ligature free those TVs can be removed easily it's just a very functional space and I, I give a lot of credit to our DHEC official for allowing us to pilot this and, and build this and to Steve Coe for helping us design it so being an academic medical center we thought we would study the impact of this on um, two of our key outcomes. Um, one is ED, average length of stay, which is essentially how long does a patient stay in the ED? And we used discharged patients. We also are, are very concerned about patients that leave without treatment. A lot of data shows that patients that do leave without treatment are, are high acuity patients. Those are patients that are sick, they're funded, they have a choice, they can go to another hospital. Um, but but most importantly, they are sick and they need our care. So I'll step you through this slide. If you look in the first column, we looked at the number of visits before and after, for four weeks before and four weeks after we opened the D-Pod. And you'll note we saw 200 more patients in the four weeks after we opened the D-Pod. That was just a random thing that happened. So 2,600 in the four weeks before and 2,800 in the four weeks after. We'll move over two columns to the median length of stay. The median length of stay for all patients in the emergency department, not just in the D-pod, in the four weeks before we opened was 197 minutes. That dropped by 16 minutes after we opened the D-pod to 181 minutes. So our median length of stay dropped, but our number of patients went up by 200 patients. It just goes to show the um, improved flow for all patients when you right-size patients, when you put the right patient in the right location at the right time. And then lastly, our patients that leave without treatment. Those are the ones that make every ED administrator and every ED clinician not able to sleep at night, essentially. Those are patients that were sick, they came to you for help and you couldn't help them. So I'll direct you to the leave without treatment column. We saw 205 patients leave without treatment in the four weeks before we opened the D-Pod. That was 5.4% of our, 
our total volume. After we opened the DPOD, we saw a reduction in, from 205 to 141. So we saw an additional 64 patients not leave without treatment in those four weeks after. And it was 3.6% of our, our um, total, our total volume that left without treatment was 3.6% contrasted with the 5.4% um, before. So what does this mean? What, so we saw more patients, fewer left without treatment. On our next slide, you'll see essentially it translated to increased capacity. We were able to see more patients in the same square footage without building new walls, if that makes sense. We, were, we had 13 spaces in a historically probably what? eight or nine patients would fit in that normally, Brian, on stretchers. So it was a, it was a big win for us. We, we translated our saved minutes to an additional 7.86 patients per day. Our left without treatment, well, it's actually patient, it's revenue not walking out the door in addition to caring for patients that really need our help. So again, we saw 64 additional patients not leave without treatment in the four weeks after opening the D-Pod. And at the end of the day, it's about staying afloat. So by seeing those extra 7.86 patients per day, when we multiply that by our average charge per patient, I'm sorry, average collection per patient on the facility side, that was an additional $2.58 million that the facility would realize when those numbers were annualized. So what does all, I, we just want to take, uh, I guess, a step back here and from a sort of design and architectural perspective, um, historically review what precedents and backgrounds have led up to where we are today. In 2009, Scott Lamiter, uh, Latimer rather, um, came out with a seminal piece that really uh, talked about are we supersizing healthcare. And it's no coincidence that this uh, was published um, right at the time when we were experiencing going through the 2008 recession. Um, what Scott did was he actually uh, took a look at growth over 28 years from 1980 to 2008 and really tried to understand where the incremental growth um, in both that he was seeing happening in room size and departmental square feet. Um, what was attributing, uh, what, was, uh, what were the factors actually um, making that happen? Um, Scott recognized that the year of construction um, impacted some of that, uh, regional variability, uh, the level of urbanization, these all sort of factored into uh, the growth and size. But really, there were other things, uh, patient care and operational models, uh, consumer-driven uh, health care, uh, the demographics of the uh, particular patient and patient acuity. Technology uh, had an impact, but also codes and regulations. Uh, we do know that over this period of time, um, within our codes and regulations, that um, when in doubt, we added more square footage to the minimum requirements for spaces. Now, um, recognizing with all these factors and what might happen um, really forces us to understand what might happen in the future. Um, here in 2009, we were coming out of reception or, uh, or recession or still in it, and uh, wanted to think about the fact that in the future there could be um, 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 you know, less uh, availability to capital. Um, we actually want to be responsible stewards of our uh, clients' um, um, sort of money and investments. Um, there also is an increasing desire for efficiency. Um, there's, we see staffing shortages without, uh, throughout the country and escalating costs. And we actually think all of these need to offset or start us to look critically at um, uh, sizing spaces in excess of what they are required to do. So 
I think in 2009, this discussion was ripe to start happening on the heels of the recession, and, and Scott really uh, came out with a wonderful piece uh, asking or challenging the um, industry to think critically about the amount of space that's required or needed, not the amount of space that we would desire or want to have. So if we move forward a year, um, a sort of thought leader design thinking firm out of England called Priestman Good um, really wanted to take a look to see if they could apply what they see in a hotel or a passenger jet um, interior um, on what they would consider a recovery lounge. Uh, this was not implemented. It was more of a sort of an idea, but the it got a lot of traction. The Financial Times, The Guardian, others were saying if we were able to have spaces like this, um, great cost and savings um, would be enjoyed. And uh, what was uh, frustrating, I think, for Priestman, uh, Priestman Good is that there was no uh, ability to actually implement this because the uh, codes and regulations did not allow it. Moving forward, um, in Canada, there was a case study or McGill Jewish General Hospital um, within the emergency department was wanting to respond uh, to overflow uh, and the great number of patients that they were seeing. They came up with what they called was RAS, R-A-Z, the Rapid Assessment Zone. And you can see here um, sort of uh, almost taking a lot of the cues from the Priestman Good uh, study is that in order to deal with overcrowding, um, that they put together um, these types of spaces and in order to address the ESI's uh, fives and fours, and um, we did see uh, the feedback from that is that there were con some concerns about privacy and noise, um, all things that we can manage, but also that um, this was very beneficial um, for the lower acuity patients. In more recent years at ASEP, the uh, emergency physicians uh, conferences and other things, uh, we are seeing that designers and clients uh, like Christine are working with manufacturers to come out with uh, modular systems, pod systems, other things. And it is starting to have an impact on the industry which I think again is putting um, uh, pressure on the codes and regulations to uh, come up with a point of view, um, at least um, a, a position uh, as to uh, what is the minimum size for safety and care and that really we should be doing this through a multidisciplinary um, simulation uh, to understand what that is rather than having it um, um, sort of uh, determined uh, by the manufacturers of products. So let's turn now to the actual development of the low acuity pod uh, that we work together on. You can see on the left-hand side many questions as to uh, what size chair should we base it on, um, what if it's five feet wide, what if it's seven feet wide, what if it's six feet in length, um, what different um, impacts each of these might have. Um, the diagrams there were done by HKS with David Vincent. And the right-hand side is almost uh, sort of a virtual or uh, theoretical um, 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 representation of the proposal uh, or what uh, we are offering within the vertical treatment, low acuity patient treatment, um, uh, which is 40 square feet and five foot six wide. Now, how did we come to that? Um, was it just arbitrary? Uh, <laughs> certainly not. Um, we actually took advantage that there was a um, um, AAH and ACHA, which are uh, organizations that deal with architecture and health um, and healthcare. And there's a, there was a summer uh, workshop there. And with FGI, we ran a workshop where we gave a presentation to talk about some of the uh, issues and uh, the facts. Um, and uh, we then actually had um, these mock-ups um, 
within the room. There were about 120 people attending, and we started running different uh, scenarios, simulations, getting feedback, eliciting uh, points of view. Uh, you will see uh, that to the left in both of the pictures, uh, that is Christine. Uh, the gentleman in the center uh, with his back to us is David Vincent from HKS, and sort of off to his right-hand shoulder is uh, myself with a name tag on with a lighter pants pointing and running this workshop. Um, so within this workshop itself, taking advantage of all these thought experts and leaders and all the people that we had there, um, we actually uh, worked to have adaptable and movable uh, partitions. We actually had um, partitions cut and made where they could be increased by six inch uh, increments. We actually had a five foot wide um, treatment station, a five and a half foot wide treatment station. That's where we started first. Uh, Stryker was very generous in um, lending us uh, their True Rise uh, chair, which happens to be 34 inches wide. And we had people sit in these, you know, kick the tires, take a look. Um, and some of the comments from some of those concerned were, well, you know, five definitely feels too small. Five and a half feet feels good, but maybe it should be six feet. So we actually um, increased it and went up to six feet. If you can actually see at the very back there, um, in the middle, uh, there are three pieces of, um, I'll take my pointer over it, right here. You can see these are incremental uh, in how we actually increase the size of these uh, uh, modules and simulations. But the feedback in general consensus was that the six foot width, while it was um, nice to have, the additional six feet did not make the space safer nor more efficient, that you could conduct what you needed to do in the five foot six wide, 40 square foot clear floor area um, module. Um, and as we talk about in um, FGI and requirements and regulations is we never recommend designing to what we call the minimum requirements. What we mean by minimum requirements is that we feel strongly that if you do not meet the minimum requirements and you fall short of those, uh, the space will be less safe, you're compromising safety, and you're more than likely compromising uh, efficiency. So while Brian, we are... Brian. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to interject before we leave these two slides um, about one of the things that came up in that session was that the space was too small for family members that accompanied the patients. And I wanted to highlight again that managing the patient's expectation. We um, don't want a lot of family members to accompany patients with low acuity complaints. We want to get them in and out and have them on their way for the rest of the day. We do recognize the need for a family member or a significant other, and you'll see in each of these photographs or mock-ups a chair for the single person to accompany the patient. But that, that came up repeatedly, and again, it goes to managing the patient and family's expectations. They're not going to be there for a long time. And for privacy and other reasons, we, we specifically do not want those other family members to come back. That's a, that's a great point. One thing that we did in the scenarios is we actually took a look to see um, what the five foot six, if required, a lot of people wanted to be able to know that they could um, pull a patient out or resuscitate, um, address, you know, a serious need if it should arise. And we actually ran different scenarios to see how this would work. Um, I think, Christine, you might add here that um, uh, there were some people who wanted the space to address every single scenario and situation. Um, yeah, so we, again, I think I mentioned this in the beginning of the presentation, emergency departments are very dynamic. And um, we 
designed these spaces to accommodate a low acuity patient, recognizing that at times we get this sort of initial triage wrong. So I'll move over to the resuscitation patient. Although we would recline a patient who's suddenly arrested, let's say, and maybe initiate CPR, at the same time, all of these chairs roll. Every manufacturer that we've worked with have these reclining chairs on wheels. So we can recline them, initiate CPR, and as we are rolling to a higher acuity area nearby, um, we're, we're giving CPR. So we don't want to run codes in these rooms or have ventilators in these rooms. These are very, very clearly for low acuity patients, and they are dynamic. The, the scenarios are dynamic. In other words, we move patients to the right place at the right time. So building on that, um, the proposed low acuity patient treatment station, uh, five foot six in clear width uh, minimum and uh, minimum clear floor area of 40 square feet, um, we feel is, su uh, is sufficient to accommodate patient safety, privacy, and satisfaction concerns. Um, we, uh, by actually formalizing this, um, we actually bring some rigor uh, to these makeshift spaces um, and non-compliant spaces and improve uh, what we mentioned before, the entire patient experience and staff experience. And uh, by keeping them small, we feel that it appropriately limits the clinical use, meaning um, these are for uh, patients who should be sitting um, and should not be um, flexed uh, in a situation where you might find that people start to put gurneys in them. So a larger size lower acuity patient treatment station we felt was starting to border on the size of the multiple bay uh, cubicle uh, or bay that is allowed within the emergency department, which is 80 square feet. Um, and we did not want to have a, a larger sort of um, minimum requirement for the lower acuity patient treatment station because of the tendency uh, to maybe think, well, it, it looks large enough to put a stretcher in here. Why don't we start having stretcher type patients in here? So we specifically uh, wanted to make sure that the space was appropriate in size. Um, we can always, as MUSC uh, did, was choose to have larger uh, to uh, address the design that you uh, have on hand, but we do not want to go smaller. So what we also took into consideration were some more sort of uh, practical um, uh, considerations. We often see in healthcare design a 30-foot structural, um, you know, column to column center line uh, bay, um, and with six-inch uh, uh, dividers between these. Should you use um, want, want, want to uh, divide them with uh, full walls? Um, we looked at the fact that you could actually have five of these within a 30-foot column bay. You can also see that we wanted to have the ability where these could be right-handed or left-handed, that type of flexibility. And also the fact that you could configure them, as you saw for McGill and, and Priestman uh, Good, is uh, you know a pinwheel, a staggered, um, other items like that. Really trying to uh, think about flexibility and also how you might be able to put this into um, existing spaces. So at 40 square feet per um, uh, lower, treatment, uh, lower acuity treatment station, um, 40 square feet actually is, uh, can fit into an 80 uh, square foot um, existing ED bay twice, or an existing um, ED room, uh, at 120 square feet, which often is larger, you technically could put three positions into there. We are not suggesting or recommending that you just roll two chairs into a multiple bay ED uh, bay at 80 square feet. We are saying that if you were to do a renovation, 
um, by uh, limiting it to the five foot six and the 40 square feet, it does help us address uh, current conditions that you have and you might find yourself in with structural bays and walls that uh, fall you know, for 80 square feet and 120 square feet. So we think it lends itself to some adaptability um, if you uh, should be looking to uh, retrofit or renovate um, and refresh an existing emergency department because we need to be realistic. Um, every renovation costs money and um, we are all um, conscious of how much money we are spending uh, in healthcare these days. So we're getting to the final portion of um, this presentation. Um, we wanted to be clear that the low acuity patient treatment vertical spaces are held to the same support standards as the other spaces within the emergency department. So that means the same standard of one position, uh, uh, one hand washing station for four of these positions, one patient toilet room for six of these um, positions, considerations for privacy, for lighting, for documentation. Um, we actually uh, figured out or may ha have proposed uh, minimum electrical outlets um, per recliner or chair. Um, we are recommending that there is a nurse call device, that medical gases are allowed within these spaces, and then of course these are supported by um, nursing stations, clean supply rooms, sewer rooms, storage rooms, um, environmental services rooms. So putting all of this into actual um, legal ease or uh, requirements or regulation um, or verbiage, Within the white paper, you will find two pages. One page is almost in a narrative form, as if the section would have been inserted into the 2018 guidelines. So you'll see there uh, on the left-hand side, sec uh, chapter 2.2, section 3136 is a new number. Um, and you can see that uh, number uh, eight is the low acuity patient treatment station. We describe what it is. Um, and then we actually have under uh, A, the space requirements of 40 square feet, the minimum uh, width of five foot six, uh, privacy considerations, there's more on these pages, this is just um, a, a blow up. On the right hand side, uh, we even went uh, as far as looking at uh, within the table sections of table 2.1-1, and dash two and dash three, which are addressing uh, the electrical outlets, the nurse call stations, and the medical gas, uh, medical gases within these spaces. So we wanted to make it not only clear, but as easy as possible for um, institutions, providers, designers to actually approach their authorities having jurisdiction with material in hand that you can. Uh, refer to and actually point to and have a discussion. And because we really are looking for your input um, when we get to the open comment um, proposal uh, uh, for considerations for 2022, in some ways we are proffering this up, this language up as a proposal for 2022, and we would like to get input um, from the audience and everybody within the industry. But um, we felt that 2022 was too far away. We, we didn't want FGI to not take a position on this and wait another four years um, with people just having makeshift spaces and having authorities having jurisdiction coming in and saying, you can't have these spaces. Where in the guidelines allow you to have them? And now, finally, there's language in here where you could go to your authority, uh, authority having jurisdiction, and if there are any AHJs on this webinar, I, I, I do want to draw your attention to um, you know, chapter one, chapter 1 1.1, and within the appendix, it really uh, stresses the fact that the regulations and requirements are not intended to restrict innovation and improve in the design and construction techniques. That really people uh, should be able to come to the authorities having jurisdiction, have a dialogue, discuss with them, 
and propose deviations that um, meet the applicable intent or objective of safety and efficiency um, and to be more creative um, because the requirements are uh, in many ways reactionary and we want to get out in front of that a bit and uh, arm people with the material that they need in order to have more fluid type spaces. So um, with that, um, unless Christine has something to add, this is the formal um, uh, end of this presentation. Um, Christine, are, are, are you good or, or would you like to no, I, make I, a summary? I think, yep. I think my, my summary is that this is an opportunity for all of us to recognize that we have to innovate and re-engineer how we deliver care in a more efficient manner, being stewards of our resources. And it's an opportunity to develop minimum standards. And as you mentioned, using clinicians, uh, architects, nurses, uh, you know, everybody, a multidisciplinary approach to um, design will create the best possible environment of care for our patients. Thank you very much for this informative session. There was a lot of content here, a lot of good information. And I did receive a couple of follow-up questions for you, so I, I hope you're ready. So one of, one of the questions is, is, what would you say is the some of the biggest factors that are shaping emergency departments these days, or really in the, in the next few years? Um, I'll start with that if you don't mind. So although we've been talking about low acuity care, there's um, really good evidence to say that patients are becoming sicker. So the acuity overall is going up. Um, having said that, I, I feel that we are prepared in many ways to care for the sickest of the sick. We are also seeing decreased access to care. There are fewer and fewer primary care providers out there and by default, many of those types of patients are ending up in the ED, necessitating this discussion we've just had about vertical patient care. I also think that the um, environment of care for behavioral health is changing. It's uh, extremely dynamic, very hot topic right now. I, I don't know what we're going to see, but I do know that behavioral health patients are are presenting to the EDs with more frequency and they're staying for longer periods of time. So that will be a challenge that I, I think we should probably get ahead of as well. And then lastly, the way that we as the providers are delivering care is going to radically change in the next probably five to 10 years. And specifically, I feel like we'll be delivering more telehealth. We'll be delivering care on people's iPhones. Um, we'll be delivering care from one ED to another ED that doesn't have the same or similar resources that we have. So I think we will need to think about inserting areas to provide quick telehealth consults and um, such embedded in EDs. Um, Brian, I'll yeah, I, 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 I can only um, sort of reiterate or stress what Christine is saying. Um, there was a sort of reimagining an uh, ED um, all-day work session last fall, and um, of, I think, 12 tables of thought leaders of about 10 people at each table, three to four of those tables decided to take on sort of reinventioning or re reimagining behavioral health. And the big issue here is, um, is the fact that what's happening in the ED is the fact that they're, it's very difficult to place these patients in actual rooms, in patient rooms. So the burden is falling on the emergency department where some of these um, behavioral health patients can be there for two or three days. Um, so I think you are right, Christine, that that's something we're going to have to grapple with and deal with. I think we're also, uh, we don't quite understand the impact yet of all these uh, new types of care of the urgent care centers of the doc in the box i'm in manhattan here and and the doc in the box are popping up all over the place almost like um 
sort of uh, those little uh, satellite bank teller um, sort of uh, cash machines, you know, Chase Bank or, 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 or Bank of America will have a little um, slot, you know, uh, that's 20 feet wide or 15 feet wide with a couple of machines. And then we're seeing more and more of these dock in the box all over the place. Um, technology is going to have a huge impact and technology uh, combined with home care. I think um, there's going to be more ED follow-up as opposed to, you know, sitting here for the next six hours while a drip is happening, but sending somebody home um, and actually being able to follow up with technology. Um, the other thing is I think always, always, always um, cost. Um, the cost to deliver the care, but also the cost to construct these spaces. And I think one of the motivations um, we uh, were um, uh, addressing here is coming from a very dense uh, urban center at uh, essentially project costs over a thousand dollars per square foot um, we are going to see uh, I think institutions really trying to limit their cost and see if they can create um, uh, appropriate size spaces but likely smaller size spaces um, in order to address um, the overcrowding within emergency departments so um, yeah I, I, I think those are some of the factors that I think uh, are going to continue to impact the emergency departments going forward some of the challenges and 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 really not uh, we can't look at all of these as challenges, as as opportunities. These are really opportunities to um, to make a change and 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 find improvements. Thanks very much for that. I do have a second question. I think we touched on, upon this, and I think it's worth re-emphasizing. The question is. It seems a bit risky to have someone in a vertical pod. If they were to have an unexpected emergency, will their care be compromised because they're in a pod? So I'll start with Christine, that. Christine, do you having want to handle lived, that one? Great. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Ha having lived that, I mean, we I live in this D-pod, and I practice clinically in that environment. And, of course, we have had patients that have had a cardiac arrest in the environment, completely unanticipated. In fact, we've had a visitor who's sitting in the chair next to the recliner have a cardiac arrest. As I mentioned before, these spaces are embedded within our EDs. So there is a probably 60 second delay in getting them onto a stretcher, but care is initiated immediately. And as Brian showed you with the striker chairs that we um, used in our simulation, um, all of these chairs recline fully, and many, in our case, many of these spaces have oxygen and have, have such. So I truly do not believe that an individual patient's care is harmed if they have, if they have a decline in their status in the chair. And I know for certain that the care of all patients is improved in that Again, we have fewer patients leave without treatment, and those are generally the sickest patients. So by enhancing our ability to care for all patients in a shorter length of time, we're really overall improving the care for all. Yes. Um, Brian. I'm actually going to chime in here, um, and it's coming from it from a different perspective, so it's not quite answering the question, but I want to point out that some of the objections um, from the authorities having jurisdiction when uh, Christine and I would propose these at, um, uh, propose the low acuity vertical treatment uh, position at um, some of our conferences and other work sessions is uh, the AHJ's approach regulations from how can this be taken advantage of? How can this regulation be abused? And there were um, uh, concerns from AHJs um, from the perspective of, well, are we going to start seeing emergency departments with no with no exam treatment rooms and only vertical vertical bays? Should we have a um, a sort of a minimum ratio that we can only allow one of these per six ED treatment positions? And and I think. We have to remember that 
emergency departments and physicians and, and clinicians are in the business because they want to take care of patients and they want to take care of patients in appropriate type space. Um, and, um, you know, you could build, um, you know, an emergency department with all trauma rooms and no enclosed uh, ED exam rooms. And we're not seeing that. And I don't think this is going to happen. Um, uh, I think what you're going to see is you're going to see an appropriate amount of space allotted to um, these vertical treatment uh, positions. Uh, you're going to see an area um, or areas within an emergency department that is um, dedicated to these types of patients to keep them out of the back or um, sort of pull them to their own area or a site so they can have a faster throughput and not and, and reduce the overall length of stay. So um, I know that wasn't Yvonne really answering that question, but I did want to um, maybe address that comment that might come up um, in in future questions that I know we're going to get. Well, thank you. I'm sure it's a perspective that many will will wonder about, and and this really is a very compelling topic, uh, and that is all the time we have today for Q and A. Uh, if uh, we have we will be able to respond to any question that we weren't able to get to during the live session. Uh, so you don't need to worry about that. So thank you very much for joining us and uh, to everyone out there. And a special thanks for our presenters, Brian Langlands and Dr. Christine Carr. It's truly been very informative. And for our audience, please remember to see the person who registered your site at the close of this session for information on receiving learning units or a certificate. You must be registered through MADCAD to take the survey and obtain credit. Here's a look at the complete webinar series that FGI is offering on the 2018 Guidelines for Design and Construction Documents. We hope you'll be able to join us for each presentation. Keep current with what's happening at FGI, including updates on adoption, errata, and the 2022 re revision cycle by signing up for our quarterly newsletter, the FGI Bulletin, or follow us on LinkedIn. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.